uh, of Debian with the Jesse tag, you can see that very, very quickly, it pops me into this little shell here, and I'm actually inside a container. Um, so I can do things like ls, run normal Unix commands, run apt-get, right? So apt-get is on the system, and it actually works. I can do things like apt-get update and apt-get install minus y c matrix. That won't work. And it will run. Uh, it looks like the connection's not so great. <laughs> but it'll run, it's okay, I'll just keep talking while it's going. Um, and I now have this like tiny little Linux environment and starting it up was really fast. Um, so actually maybe you wanna just hold off for like 15 minutes and I'll take questions maybe in like 10 minutes. Uh, um, and uh, so this is actually running like in a VM on my Mac. Uh, I don't actually care about installing these packages so I'm just gonna kill it. And you know, in a container, you can just you can just do stuff like this, and um, right, it's, it's dangerous to preserve root, not preserve root. You can do stuff that otherwise would be totally stupid, like that, and it's fine. Um, like uh, you know, I can rm minus rf slash in a container, and it's just removing all the files in the container. So you can see I pop back here, and like Docker is still working fine, and. Um, that container is still around, uh, but I can just get rid of it if I want and say like docker rm minus f of this and boom, it's gone. Uh, and so it's really cool how you can like create containers super fast. Uh, for instance, um, you can do things like this. Uh, um, for, for i in like 0 to 20, do docker run minus d, so minus d will actually run in the background. Uh, we'll say Debian Jesse, since I already have that one around. Um, and I'm just gonna make a little shell loops, like tiny little daemon that's, uh, you know, not very exciting, but it gets the job done of demonstrating a point that containers start up really fast. So I'll just run this little shell loop here and then if I exit out of this, you can see that each one of these little, you know, kind of uh, SHA-looking kind of things, it's not actually a cryptographic hash, it's just a random string, um, is a container. So I just started up like 20 containers, um, and I can like look at them all in Docker PS. So you can see that each one is this own little container running side by side by side, and, you know, in, in this case it's just a little Debian uh, container that's running um, a little bash loop, but uh, I can actually use Docker logs to actually see the standard out of that container. So I can say minus minus tail three, follow this, and it will say, okay, here's this uh, output of the container. So this is what the container is actually logging to standard out, and it will also show you standard error as well. Um, and so, you know, uh, Something I kind of like to point out is like, look how fast and cheap those containers are, right? So, uh, like we just did a little bash loop here, or a shell loop, but um, you know, we could definitely uh, be running a whole bunch of different stuff side by side, and uh, it's not gonna eat up overhead like a VM would, because it's all using the same kernel, uh, and it just happens to be isolated off using these sort of kernel primitives uh, that, um, you know, work at a slightly higher level than like uh, traditional type one or type two hypervisor would. Um, and you know, the thing about containers is they're really meant to be ephemeral, so I can do stuff like kill all the containers, um, and it will just kill them all, no problem, uh, and remove them all. So Docker RM to actually remove containers. And now you can see I don't have any containers around, and it was really fast to just create 20 containers, kill them all, and remove them all. Uh, and so it enables a lot of really cool creative things. Um, and then kind of the other thing that's pretty cool is um, uh, like, you know, I've been sort of alluding to images without really talking about what they are. Well, you see this little eHazlet slash Elasticsearch bit on the end here? That's the image name, so what I can actually do is take a pre-baked Docker image that someone else has prepared or that I've prepared and run it, 
and it will run the same way in every single situation. Um, I mean, in terms of the file system, if there's like network weirdness or that kind of thing going on, Docker's not going to help you. Um, but the exact same files with the exact same program are running, so it kind of takes care of this really bad problem that a lot of people have where, well, it worked on my machine, but now, you know, I was a developer developing an application on Mac where I installed my all my dependencies using Brew, um, and then I pushed my code, it all looked fine, but when Ops went to actually go run it in production, it turns out that I got a slightly different thing with my Brew install than they have running on Linux and Prod, and now it's this like insanely painful debugging process that takes hours and hours to figure out, oh, we need a different version of libc or something. Um, and by the way, if we try to upgrade that for this one package, uh, it's going to break all these other sort of apps that we have running side by side. Um, so Docker really helps a lot with that portability story. Um, so um, the marketing tagline is kind of build, ship, and run any app anywhere. Um, I like to put a little asterisk after anywhere and say asterisk, as long as it's Linux. Because <laughs> uh, it will really work well on most modern Linux distros. The bits that do all the containery things are all Linux right now. Um, so if you use Docker on Mac or on Windows, you're actually running a Linux VM usually. Um, now in the future, there will actually be Windows containers through Docker. Uh, Microsoft is working with us to put the same primitives into the Windows kernel that made things possible in the Linux kernel in the first place. Um, and so there will actually be Docker containers for Windows Server as well. Um, and uh, so what I was kind of getting at about the repeatability story is like my friend Evan Hazlitt made this Elasticsearch image that I downloaded and now I can just run um, you know, without necessarily needing to know anything about installing Elasticsearch and that kind of thing. Um, and you know, uh, I can go and, and look at his, uh, the way that he generated it on the Docker Hub. Oh wait, I forgot I broke this. So, um, like, he actually has this set up as an automated build so that Docker Hub will rebuild the image for you uh, if you just put your Docker file, which is kind of like a way of describing a, a recipe to build your Docker image uh, in the source code repo. So, you know, if I really wanted to, there's nothing that forces me to use Evan's image. I could just go and look at the Docker file, or, you know, the recipe that he used to create that image and run it for myself. Uh, so it's kind of the Docker equivalent of the building from source. Um, and so that's a pretty cool feature of Hub that you can have automated builds and, and have the little Docker file right side by side um, because, uh, you know, it's basically you shouldn't really trust just random images that don't tell you anything about what they contain or where, where they came from. Uh, so. Uh, I don't really know anything about Elasticsearch, but you can see that it's running here, and I can check on the logs with like Docker logs, um, and that's pretty cool. I've also forwarded reports uh, from, you know, like uh, my reports <coughs> from the container to 32.770 on the host. So um, I can actually use the host-only network that I set up with this machine. Um, there's nothing forcing you to use Docker Machine. You can do really similar things with like Vagrant or other kinds of virtualization technology or just like rolling it yourself with VBox if you really want to. Um, but the point is that uh, I have this little host-only adapter here and uh, like if I go to port 80, there's nothing there. But um, let's see. If I go and look at this port that Docker has routed for me, I think this one's the admin. Oh no, that's not the admin. That's just the, uh, this is a little uh, JSON bit that's returned from Elasticsearch. So you know, you can see if I go to that port, I'm actually hitting that Elasticsearch instance that I have running. And um, okay, so that, that one doesn't do anything. So I'm not really sure what that port is for. Uh, but the other one actually did do stuff. So that's cool. Um, but you know, I don't really know anything about installing or configuring Elasticsearch, but the point is that I could give these images to like developers on my team that don't necessarily need to know how to set it up on their laptop. And you know, we have like other tools that make sort of the automation around developing with containers and, and then eventually deploying them and that kind of thing uh, a lot easier. Um, so you can see this little JSON bit returned in my browser here uh, from 
Elasticsearch using that host-only virtual box network. Um, yeah, so, uh, and if my Wi-Fi was a little bit better, uh, I think I would maybe attempt a uh, Docker Compose up. Maybe actually, I think I can give this a whirl. So I'm going to try something out here. Um, So uh, we have a tool called Compose where you can kind of like define your stack of containers in a little YAML file. And uh, you know, it's, it's just really nice because you, know, you might have multiple containers in one app. Uh, so this is a way of sort of describing this is what the containers that make up my app and this is how they interact. And then you don't have to remember all these like unwieldy Docker run commands that you have to sort of like always do in the correct order and get the flags right and then you're like, Oh man, I mistyped minus minus volumes as minus minus volumes, some or you know something like that. Uh, so, so let's see if this will work for me. Um, I'm going to. You can see here in the Docker machine output, I actually have this like server running on DigitalOcean. Uh, so, I'm going to do like a uh, Docker machine and droplet to make the Docker client talk here. And now you can see these are my containers running on that server. Uh, nice. Uh, info tells me, you know, one of the labels that the daemon has is that the provider it's on is DigitalOcean, which, by the way, a big value proposition of Docker in terms of the repeatability story is just cross cloud, right? So I was just talking earlier today about how. Right now, if everyone's, if people are going cloud, they're likely like tightly coupling their application to Amazon, and you know for a variety of reasons, like tightly coupling your application to just one cloud provider is kind of a bad idea uh, because you know there might be new guys in the game that are better later, and uh, or or Amazon just decides to start messing with you and you have no choice because you can't move. So a, a big concern for a lot of people is lock-in. You know, people don't want another Oracle or another uh, Microsoft, I guess. And, uh, you know, so that's what, where people, I think, see a lot of value in Docker. So let's see if this will work for me. Uh, I haven't tried this on the actual DigitalOcean server. Um, but basically, when you do Docker Compose up, it'll actually go and, like, pull the images that make up your app and also build them if it needs to actually build them from files that are around locally. Um, and then kind of like boot them up in the correct <coughs> order and like interlace the logs together in real time. So uh, we'll see when this finishes uh, how this goes. But uh, if this all works, it will be my little PHP app that I can show you. Um, yeah, so while this is running, I'll go ahead and start taking questions. I know that one um, guy left. Yeah, so uh, have you ever have you had a chance to play with anything from uh, Joint and Smart Data Science and new Docker support? Right, so I, I haven't, but I've heard a lot about it and it's really super cool. Um, the joint guys are doing really interesting work in that area because, like, like they're running Docker on Solaris, basically, um, or SmartOS, I think. Container. What's that? But it's Linux inside the container. Yeah, it's there's something weird that they do where they have like so a way of turning. They emulate all the kernel uh, right. API calls on right. the Solaris kernel. Uh, they run uh, all the variety. You know, they start with Ubuntu 10. They're running Ubuntu 14.4 now. Um, they ran. You know what Flying Relay is? Uh, I know what a quine is. It's where a program outputs the source code in another language. Oh. Or, uh, outputs itself in another language. Nice. Well, they found a 100 language quine relay uh, that exposed all sorts of bugs. Uh, includes there's a language that cr creates binaries that run. Uh, that oh, so this is like how they. Binaries that run by accident on Linux, and they fixed those bugs. Nice. So this so is like the. All your Docker uh, stuff should run on SmartOS. That's like how they worked out the like user space like incompatibility stuff. Yes. That's fine. Yeah. yeah, but that's cool. all like all the GNU tools there, all of it if you're yeah. comfortable with app get, but let's say you want to detrace one of your applications. You yeah, exactly. Through. Yeah, yeah. So that's really cool. I mean they're doing super cool work in that area. Um, Brian Cantrill is the CTO I think of Joint and he's a really smart guy. I've been following so really entertaining to listen to Nice. I've been following <laughs> his like you know talks and stuff a little bit. Um, but one of the things we're interested in is like,
for instance, making a uh, driver for, for that, for Triton, with Docker Machine, so that like you could have like a Triton endpoint, basically, as part of your like little swarm. And in that way, you're like, okay, just treat it like my other VMs and endpoints, right? So I think they wrote an uh, endpoint for Smart Data Center. So you basically yeah. you have one Docker machine that can be a whole data center of machines. Yeah, yeah, so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Like, but yeah, super cool area. Totally check it out. Uh, question? Yeah, um, I, for uh, testing in, in your own PC, I was interested in using uh, Docker with uh, Zookeeper to run multiple mm -hmm. instances and kill the instances mm -hmm. so I can learn about um, the stability of the cloud based uh, swarm. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering if you have any. Um, well, I don't know if I really have anything specific, but I can tell you that that sounds like a great use case to me, uh, just because, you know, so you'll, you'll have to be figuring out how you want to actually configure the network. So, like, you want to, you know, you're going to need, uh, like, a way for all those instances to, to like discover each other, so you have to kind of figure that out. So I'd start thinking about that like sooner rather than later, um, and then also just like you know, Zookeeper might be kind of a pain to build. So I would go to Docker Hub and like see if I actually know for a fact that people have Zookeeper Docker files. Like I would use that as probably a starting point if you want to build an image that is running Zookeeper, um, just because like then that'll save you sort of the headache of like, all right, what do I do to like install this from scratch? Uh, and that kind of thing. So, oh yeah, yeah let's get started. That's where it's going to hang for a second there. Uh, the network's not so good, but that's pretty much part for the course uh, for conferences. Um, so, does that help you a little bit? Or yeah, I, mean, I guess I guess where I had stuff first to do was Node.js can talk with Docker. Has Node.js can talk with Docker. Has MongoDB. So I was wondering mm. if comments about taking two containers together. Right. So you have a couple different options there. Uh, one is you can use links. So Docker has a primitive called links, where basically what it is is when you Docker run a container, you can specify minus minus link to alias to another container. And what that will do is it will give you all these environment variables inside of your linking container that tell you how to get to that other container. Um, and also you get an, you get an Etsy host entry. Um, so. Uh, you get an entry in Etsy hosts so that like you can basically just hit you know uh, Mongo or whatever and the one container will be able to talk to the other one um, and then the other thing that you could do is you could just make them share a network namespace so docker run has a minus minus net flag uh, where you can say minus minus net container and basically specify a container to share a network namespace with so that way, both of those containers like have the same local host and all that kind of stuff, and so they can kind of connect to each other similarly to how you would maybe do it if you were just running it on a quote, normal box. So, hope that helps. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm trying to figure out if Docker can be used Docker to isolate a commercial application that you need to have running on a host. So you've got, for example, you've got a monitoring application that, like that one, that will occasionally go off and decide to grab a bazillion file handles before you can shut it down, before you can go. In a way, you can use that to isolate it, though, yeah, you can't exceed Right, so there is a way to isolate, you know, some things. So I know for a fact that you can do CPU and memory, like limitations like that with Docker. Um, there might be a way, like in the C groups, to actually, um, you know, specify like, okay, you can only have this many FDs open at a certain time and that kind of thing, like you're mentioning. Um, but you really kind of have to check like lib container for that. I'm not really sure off the top of my head. Um, but that's the kind of thing that container tech is really meant to make possible. Um, so I would hope that there was a way to, to do that. So you know. That is something yeah. that the smart data center stuff will do. Nice. That's also something that if you need to do that on the Linux kernel that I would still recommend using the hypervisor. Um, oh. Currently, LXCs, so I'm a sys admin in the HPC shop, and I nice. use that to do all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, so I'm super paranoid about this stuff. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, but right now, we don't let them run Docker on our compute node. 
because uh, we do not deem it a secure one. Uh, basically, you could become root on the host if you have root and then maintain it. Yeah. Uh, so we do not allow them to do that right now. We're looking at maybe setting up like a separate sandbox environment that's maybe running the open source and our data center stuff just for those kind of applications. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the thing too. Is that um, you know, so things where you need like maximum isolation, like VMs still win. And that's why I kind of started the talk with like throughout all the sort of like things you might have heard about, our container is going to replace virtualization. I just think that's a super silly discussion to have because yes, containers might replace virtualization for some things, but only because it's things where like because the only hammer that you had was was a VM before everything looked like a nail. And now you're suddenly realizing, oh, we actually have this screwdriver and it's Docker or you know containers in general, and there are some things that it's better for. So, That's a huge, huge thing because lots of people are writing stuff to talk directly to the API. Um, and also, like lots of people are doing really crazy innovative things like PowerStrip, if you've heard of that, where they're basically sitting in front of the Docker API and acting as like a, a pro reverse proxy where they're gonna say like, all right, we're gonna create these like additional plugin endpoints that don't really exist with with Docker, and you know, likewise with with the Triton stuff. That's why you know Brian Cantrell, for instance, said the strength of Docker is in its API. Um, like doing crazy things, like okay, we want to now have volumes that we can migrate across hosts seamlessly just by talking to the Docker API, um, and that's what PowerStrip and Flocker do. If you've heard of those, so you know, I think those are really you know big advantages. The security thing, like you know, I mean, like. So, so here's the thing that you gotta keep in mind. Docker, access to Docker and what it does is root, right? So you don't give Docker to people that you don't trust with root. It's just Docker is root. That, <laughs> there was an article that came out lately that was like, privilege escalation through Docker. Well, it's not really a surprise because like Docker requires those privileges anyways. Um, so, you know, I definitely think in prod, like, don't use the Docker group as a good thing because the Docker group is just meant as a convenience, basically, uh, to let you run Docker commands without sudo. Uh, and there's all sorts of things that you can do to sort of layer up your security to make it safer, right? So, you know, like you mentioned, root in a container, right now at least, is the same as root on a host, so as the host. So, you know, well, if you have something that doesn't need to run as root, then don't run it as root, right? So you actually have a user command in a Docker file to set the user that your app should run as. Um, and that way, if there were a breakout, like, you know, okay, they're just this non-privileged user that can't do anything fun on the host. Um, you know, and, and likewise, uh, the same sort of general securing your application kind of things apply. Uh, it's not like one of the things that Dan Walsh from Red Hat always harps on is containers do not contain. Uh, so, you know, you really shouldn't be treating a container as an isolation layer for security, in my opinion. But, More of a deployment mechanism, rather than yeah. deployment and development mechanism. Yeah, that's, 
Yeah. And that's actually one key difference in why ZFS jails are much stronger from a security standpoint, is because if you're root in a ZFS jail, you're not root on the host. Well, and there are ways to accomplish that with Linux containers too, basically, where you know user namespaces is a big thing that you know we really want to get into Docker and make doing root-like things in a container a lot safer. It's just really hard from a user interface perspective to basically make it uh, still easy and nice and convenient to use, um, and also not really alienate people with like. All right, now we have this additional thing you have to do with volumes where you tack on like a UID mapping onto the end and that kind of thing. Uh, so actually, LibContainer has support for users' namespaces right now to do stuff like that, but they just uh, haven't actually been integrated into Docker itself yet because there's still an outstanding design discussion. So stay tuned on that because a lot of people want it. It will probably get in sooner rather than later. Uh, it's just one of those things that. today, let's see has well, we accept PRs, so. <laughs> uh, so anyways, I'm Nathan LeClaire. I'll be hanging around the con. Uh, if you want to come uh, hit me and talk to me about Docker or anything else, I'm pretty approachable, so uh, at least I hope so. So thank you guys a lot for coming, and have a good day.